Now we'll talk a little bit about how the imaging appearance of hemorrhage changes with time on various modalities. The CT appearance of hemorrhage is probably the most straightforward. When you have a hemorrhage on CT, the thing that most determines what it looks like is how much protein is in it. So blood is very proteinaceous fluid, like both in the serum and the red cells, and that makes it more dense in the adjacent tissue. How it's going to evolve is going to change with the size and location of the hemorrhage. Uh, when a patient's very ill, it may evolve at a different time. Here on the right, you have a graph, uh, which you can find on Radiopedia, which shows kind of the time frame as this goes on. When you start out and you're in the very acute phase, you have a very bright appearance around uh, 80 to 100 Hounsfeld units. Over time, it's going to go down. It's going to become uh, somewhat isodense to gray and white matter. And this is when you're in a window where you can have isodense subdural hematomas. Over time, it becomes more chronic and will get closer to the appearance of CSF. So here you have an example of the hemorrhage, which is evolving over time. You have a big right-sided convexity subdural hematoma. Here you see it's at a very acute phase, so you see it's very bright. Uh, the way this is windowed, it's almost as bright as the adjacent bone, although it's, it's certainly not that dense. And what you see is a lot of brightness in the extraxial space here. You see layers uh, where the serum has kind of collected off. Uh, over time, you take a couple of days. Uh, this is actually, you still have a subdural hematoma here, but it's very isodense now. Uh, so you almost can't differentiate it from the adjacent brain. Over time, uh, what will happen is this will become uh, much more like CSF. So you see the predominant uh, appearance in this imaging is very similar to the adjacent CSF. Uh, this is the appearance of a chronic subdural hematoma or chronic hygromas. Here you can see Kermit's uh, about to find out about his uh, own appearance on imaging. Now the appearance of hemorrhage on MR is uh, significantly more complex than on CT, and the MR appearance of hemorrhage is really governed by hemoglobin, the sort of oxidation state that it's in, and uh, that's how the MR appearance is determined. Now, in general, if you're looking at an MR and you have hemorrhage and it's bright, that brightness is coming from that hemoglobin, uh, so the methylated form of hemoglobin. Uh, when it's too, too bright, uh, that tends to be related to the hydration of that hemoglobin, so we have a lot of water around hemoglobin. Uh, so again, you see a graph from Radiopedia here. This is a very common illustration that's used to show the evolution of hemorrhage IMR over time. When you start out, you're in the immediate phase. Uh, it's very kind of iso-intense on both T1 and T2. If you see this graph, shows you the T2 appearance on this axis, T1 appearance on the y-axis here. Now, as time passes, the oxyhemoglobin becomes deoxyhemoglobin, uh, which is somewhat darker on T2, so you get kind of a dark appearance, and that usually happens in the first day or so, but you're still iso-intense on T1. As that deoxyhemoglobin is converted to that hemoglobin, it gets bright on T1, and this is when you have the classic brightness on T1, kind of that 2 to 28 days, so kind of a day to a month. And uh, over time, what's going to happen is that uh, methemoglobin is going to get hydrated and it's going to become progressively more T2 bright. So you see evolution of the T2 brightness over time. Um, in this sort of very delayed phase, what you'll see is it's going to gradually become dark on everything. And you kind of have this hemocytorin phase at the end, uh, which is kind of dark on both T1 and T2. Now, here you have a chart that kind of sums this up. Uh, so you kind of have these time phrases, uh, time frames on the left here. You have what sort of form of hemoglobin that you're dealing with in the middle here. And then you have kind of the classic uh, T1 and T2 appearance that goes along with it. Now, I've got to tell you, like, just looking at a table like this and trying to remember it is a little bit crazy. It's a little bit much, and I think it's not, uh, it's not really exactly that easy to remember. So what people have come up with is they've come up with this uh, absolutely idiotic mnemonic device. But I'll tell you about it because, I mean, I think it's, it is an easy way to remember. And you got to think about a bunch of babies, and you got to think about poop. And uh, the way this goes is I, B, Iddy, Biddy, Baby, Doo-Doo. 
you know, what this is is for each one of these. Uh, this is like the first time point, so i is going to be iso intense, b is bright. So your first thing is going to tell you the t1 appearance, and the second one is going to tell you the t2 appearance. Uh, so early, we have iso intense on t1, kind of bright on t2, and uh, then you kind of have it here. As time goes on, you become iso to dark, so you get dark on t2, and so forth. Now, people will say it's dumb. I was personally told by attending my fellowship that this was idiotic and I should stop teaching it to people. But you remember it. Anyway, this goes along with this. You see IV, Hiddy, Hiddy, AV, Doo Doo. And you see you can kind of remember that. And uh, if you're looking at a case and you have to sit down and write this out to remember it, that's fine. But it will help you figure out the timing of hemorrhage. As I said, I was a fellow in San Francisco. One of the attendings didn't think this. This is a scene from South Park where Kenny's about to uh, enter San Francisco. He's having to wear a protective suit because there's so much smugness in San Francisco. So then you get to this, it's like, well, how do you remember the times? And I think you can kind of remember, uh, remember it as a rule of A's. And so you're thinking about this and like, how does it evolve? And if you think about it, uh, the first one is about an hour. The next one is about a day. The third one is about a week. The fourth one is about a month. And then finally, towards the end, you have about a year. So if you think about just the increments of time, a day, a week, a month, a year, then you can kind of think about how these evolve over time. So here are some examples of what the appearance looks like over time. As I said at the beginning, like here you have an acute hemorrhage. Um, yeah, it's very iso-intense. And uh, so on T1, it's kind of iso-intense to adjacent brain. On T2, it's also pretty iso-intense, although you've got a little rim of hema around it. And uh, you see a little bit on susceptibility. As that gets goes from hyper-acute to acute, you have a little bit more of an evolution in terms of it becoming T2 dark. So you see it's much more T2 dark on uh, this deoxyhemoglobin phase. Now, as it transitions to subacute, what you're going to have is that development of methemoglobin. And so you can see on the T1 weighted image at the left uh, upper corner here, what you've gotten is it's become bright. And so then you're looking at methemoglobin. And then the T2 appearance like tends to vary based on how hydrated that methemoglobin is. So over time, the methemoglobin is going to come out of the red cells, be exposed to more water, and become brighter on T2. So here you see as it's getting a little later, it's uh, brighter on T2. Finally, like as it becomes chronic, what you're going to see is you're going to see something that's dark on almost all sequences. So you see something that's just ferritin. And it doesn't have a lot of signal, it's kind of dark on most of your sequences. So you see you have a little bit of darkness here on T2, although you do have some gliosis around it. You see it's dark uh, here on, on diffusion and gradient imaging as well. On MRI, like the one thing I will point out is that uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage can have a little bit of a different appearance. Uh, what you're going to see most often when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage is a little bit of dirty CSF. So here you have a FOIA image, and what you're seeing is that that's T2 hyperintense in the sulcus. So you're not getting complete suppression of that CSF. Here you see on gradient or susceptibility imaging, what you'll have is a dark uh, linear areas of susceptibility in the foci, I mean, in the sulci themselves. Um, in general, like flare or susceptibility are the best for developing. We've seen subarachnoid hemorrhage. 